Employment of legal counsel. Let me give you a little background. Senate Bill 574 amended business and professions code section 4008 to establish the board's authority to hire its own legal counsel. Subsequent to enactment as part of the January 2018 board meeting, the board directed staff to begin the recruitment process to hire the own legal counsel per the provision in SB 547. Consistent with board's directive, staff submitted the recruitment package to the department. And since that time, the board executive staff have met with the department to discuss the recruitment. And more recently, me and Vice President Lippi met with ECA Director Graffalo, Ryan Markoff, Deputy Director of Legal Affairs Divisions, and Grace Arupo Rodriguez, Assistant Deputy Director of Legal Affairs Divisions. So as part of this meeting, the board leadership was advised that the current administration does not support a decentralized legal counsel model. In view of the board hiring councils that would report directly to the board's executive office, DCA is offering a compromise proposal. So under the DCA proposal, the department would establish a limited term attorney position and would enter into an MOU with the board to fund that position. DCA would complete the recruitment for the position, but would allow a member of board staff to participate in the recruitment process. The attorney would be an employee of the department and would report to the legal affairs office for supervision. The attorney would be dedicated exclusively to board's work and would be available to work at the board's office part-time. Now, support leadership is comfortable with the DCA proposal and is presenting this alternative to the full board for its consideration. Should the board agree to accept the DCA proposal, the recruitment will be expedited. Should the board wish to reconsider its action from the January 2008 board meeting, the following language would be used as a motion to facilitate implementation of the proposal. So the motion would be table the motion taken by the board during this January 2018 board meeting relating to the hiring of the council, approve the DCA proposal to enter into MOU with the DCA for purposes of establishing an attorney for position and authorize the executive officer to carry out the proposal, including by securing the necessary funding to pay for the position. Any uh, board member discussions? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the hard work you've done on this also. I know you remember this has been a kind of a very contentious issue. Under the DCA compromise solution, who has the ability to hire, fire, or move the attorney once they're in? Um, they, they, they do, they do fine. So under that proposal, that takes it kind of goes against everything we've talked about at the board. We want to be able to retain you know, our attorneys uh, in for the you know, long run and not short term. Uh, well, yes, we, we, we wanted that, but, but this is a limited uh, term, which uh, which trying that for only like the first two years, and if this proposal doesn't work out, then we'll, we'll, we'll have to work on something else. That's what my is saying from the, the DCA. And, and, and in fact, they have, uh, they have reached out to uh, Stan uh, also to, to talk about that and um, uh, stand on this good completely. So he, he called me and he said he would agree with everything that I propose. And I actually would uh, have <coughs> asked them to, uh, to reach out to uh, uh, you and uh, board member Maria Serpa to if you have any questions they did. about it. Did they, did they talk to you about it? They didn't talk, did they talk to you, Ryan? Yeah, so yeah, as the DCA you know, re reached out to me, yeah. uh, you know, outlined you know, our concerns. Um, you know, part of the conversation was, well, this is kind of the you know, way we've always done it, and we're trying to, you know, keep, you know, stay consistent. Um, you know, we're kind of the leaders of all the boards, and I do believe in change, and change is good, and we have some great uh, attorneys, um, and I want to be able to protect them. 
Yeah. Well, we, I, we, I agree with everything that you said, uh, but like I said, DCA is still our boss, we're under them, and this is something that they, they propose for a, a short-term compromise for us to, for two, for two years only, okay? Now, if, like I said, if, if the thing don't work out in the two years, we always go back with the, the bargaining table and then we can ask for it. Well, the, 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 the challenge is, you know, coming in January of, in the, of next year, we'll have a new governor, and I'm assuming the new governor will appoint new staff. So anything that we yeah. delay will put us in peril because that bill may be you know, taken off the table. So be very clear on what you're agreeing to. Right, yeah, but. Because it, it's, not, it's not binding at all. No, no, I, I understand, but it, it, I, I know what really, really <coughs> what I agree with you, but I think this is just the best compromise that we have come to at this point. So this is Maria Serpa, and I'm just looking at the minutes from the September 7th meeting, um, where we had a lot of discussion about this. And the exact same motion was uh, not supported. Um, and I don't see any change or additional information from that meeting except for a verbal discussion with individuals outside of public meeting promising that we have a two year, um, I'm trying to word this, excuse me for having some pauses in here, but having a two-year trial for something that we're legally able to do. So I understand your, your point, President, uh, but um, my concern is we have the legal right, DCA has the legal right to push back, if that's true, but nothing has changed from September. So I don't understand. Um, well, I think uh, Stan changed his position. Um, it didn't pass then uh, because I think Stan and you and Ryan and somebody else voted against it. Mm -hmm. Stan has now oh. changed, so maybe that will change. I don't know. But we both, both Victor and I, felt after discussing it with them uh, about an hour that uh, you know, a compromise was something we were willing to take a shot at, and if it didn't work, then we would have the right to do it again. But as Ryan says, uh, it will be a different administration. My guess is that the new administration may be even more willing to do it than the current one. But I don't know the answer to that for sure. Hey, Greg, did you and Victor talk to um DCA after the September meeting? We did not. Or I did. I don't know. But I, I, I did. So this, I did. They, this call, meeting, they call me, yeah. They call me and they were concerned about, about this. Yes, they did. And that's when they talked to you. And, they called and, you yeah, and I said, well, we have to. They called Ryan and Stan. I guess I, they didn't call Miranda. Yeah, I, I, and I it showed them the phone number somehow. I don't know what happened. They, they said they will call the board members who have concerns. So, Ryan, can you so when they called you, you laid out your concerns. Right. I mean, how did they did they respond? Yeah, they, they responded. You know, to, to you know their credit, you know, they were you know, very polite, and nice, and you know, I think thoughtful in their comments, uh, which is a good thing. Um, you know, also you know, expressed some of the views that we had on this board. Uh, a two-year compromise is not a two-year compromise. A compromise will only last until January twentieth, uh, twenty nineteen, when the new uh, governor comes in. Uh, we also know that uh, DCA has had a history of a kind of a revolving door of directors. And so there's no guarantee that this new director will stand, uh, stay on. Sure. And most of the administrations also like to hire their, you know, bring their own people in, and that's you know, their prerogative to do. Well, I think so, one, one of the problems is, I, I guess, the, the medical board has its own attorney, and apparently it's been a very contentious situation. It hasn't worked out well. Uh, well, but we would have the ability to hire or fire. Right. And so, you know, we have that choice. Right now, what we're proposing is to give up that choice. Yeah. And, if, you know, someone's shorthanded somewhere, they might want to, you know, redirect the city attorney to a different department. They have that prerogative, right? And what we're trying to do is create a, uh, a system of consistency. 
Well, if they did that, I mean, they'd have to go against their promise. Right? Well, they, they, they won't have it. They're not going to have the choice. Happen. You know, come January. Right. That's true. So is this something so, we don't have to do? Well, but let me ask you something. If, let's say that we push the envelope and we get our own person, and the new administration comes in, they could remove that person, and they could do whatever they want. Correct? No, because under the statute, we, so this board has the ability to do that, not the administration. And we're giving up that right. Okay. But so won't we have that right in the future, too? Huh? Don't, won't we have that right in the future? So do we Unless they have change to... the statute. We have to change the statute. Yeah. And so as I understood that, um, that the, the department's going to look at our our legal needs and try to match. Well, they've already determined. We, we told them we need a level four attorney dedicated to us. And that's what we would be hiring if we were doing it ourselves. And they said, okay, you got it. From what I understand, the, the, can you try to confirm? Well, from what I understand, we had, because I was on the board at this time, the board had requested to hire their own attorney. Right. And they came back with the, we'll give you a level four attorney. That wasn't our original request. That was oh, yeah, their we negotiation. We always wanted to hire a level four. Our own attorney outside of DCA. Yeah. Is what the original request was, yeah. not in a DCA employee. No, but we wanted to hire an equivalent to a level four. Right, <coughs> but the difference is, this is it, it was a part of a negotiation and that wasn't our original request. We are accepting their um, response, but our original request was to meet the um, right that we have by the law, the new law Correct. that allowed us to have outside counsel. So we requested that based on right. the new law. And the outside counsel we wanted was somebody that would be a, considered a right. level four. So I just wanted to confirm that because we did right. not ask for a DCA uh, that is level true. four. That's correct. But then if you if we don't move forward, you know, you want to say I want to hire my own attorney, it's gonna take a, a, a quite a time, a process to screen and hire before you get somebody. And but in the meantime you, you won't have what they promised that that we have an attorney working exclusively for us. So do we know when they'll give us this new attorney? They said I think within thirty days, isn't it? Actually, actually what when we asked them what expedite meant, and it sounded like they said something. I remember the 30 days. Typically, yeah. so. well, the high maybe 30 to 60, and maybe 30. You talked about typically already, right? right. Yeah. Just as a just as a fellow state employee, <laughs> I will tell you that it will take at least 90 days to hire that person, yeah. Yeah. One, one way or another. So, an internal person, you're saying, Josh. Yes. So if we swap to a, an internal level four attorney, it's going to take us at least three months. No, no, I'm talking about hiring a new, if DC, whether it's DCA or the board, the state hiring processes, posting and, and uh, okay, civil service. Okay, so for service. an outside attorney, I'll take Andy. Well, I was wondering well, how quick could they flip? You mean if they have someone inside that they want yeah. to put? They, I, I don't think they could do that they because do. no one would be willing to accept a limited term position if they're already in a permanent position. No. No, no, no. If we, because they're promising us one um, level four attorney. Right. Right, but in a limited term position of two years. Right. But Higher someone within me. DCA. Someone right. Here. But the, you have to understand the way state employment works. Not so you cannot go into a limited term position without accepting limited term status, which would mean that person would be giving up their rights to permanent state employment if they were to accept if that position. If they're already in the system. So, uh, so you're basically telling me that what they promised us, we probably can't get. No, they, they promised to go outside and get us an attorney, not to give us one that's already in their employee. Okay, and they'll, they would hire them for a two years. That's what they promised us. And, and so that's probably going to take three, so let's say four or five months. Yeah, and I don't know if, uh, was there any statement, if we were to hire our own, it would, take him along with would, you know, would we have to follow the same protocols that they follow? You have to establish a position first, 
and DCA could probably establish a position faster than we could because we'd have to rely on DCA to help us with that particular task. After that, once the position is there, more or less, you're looking at minimum, I think 90 days may be a little optimistic because you have to recruit, you have to interview, you've got to give them 30 days on the other side after you select someone to start. But they would move faster if they were doing it than if we were doing it. Exactly. And we, we would need their approval. We need their approval to process certain things and they can help that, expedite. That was but, the point. But, but at the end, where they really save the time is at the front end when they're approving the position because unless it's a priority, it just becomes one more thing they need to do. So that's where the difference in them prioritizing something would really matter. Well, I, I guess I also wonder the applicant pool. Um, if the applicant pool is different for the DCA putting out a job description, hey, come work for the government, DCA, is that, I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, but that might be a different type of attorney than if we go look for our own attorney. Awesome. But either way, when you have to go through them, they have to approve them regardless. Pretty much. They, they process. They, they are your boss. You have to go through them to do a lot of things for you. you. So it's better that you work with them first uh, and then to go something against the will. That, that's what I, I might take. Sometimes you have to, not exactly everything that you wanted, it would be a good compromise. At least move forward and get your own attorney to do things that you want. Or you could say, okay, you don't want to do it, and this, this thing could drag on for the next maybe three years. It's not going to go anywhere. Well, you know, one thing is time's on our side. Yeah. In this case, time is our friend, by the way. Right. <laughs> so if it's your action on it's true. That's okay. Let me explain. You got a point. Uh, well, uh, we, what we're really trying to do is pr protect who we have here. Yeah. And I felt for the, you know, for a, it's been a long time since we had such a great group of attorneys. Um, I mean, Josh is here too. I included that Josh. Um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Great attorneys. I like that you say great attorneys and, and Josh. Josh. And, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you know, what we're really trying to do. Kind of also mentioned. Yes. What we're really trying to do is protect our great attorneys. Um, hopefully they're, you know, we're that good. You, you tend to get snatched away. Right. And we're trying to protect that from happening. Unless they win the, you know, one point six eight billion dollar jackpot today, you know, they might leave. But you know, I want to protect the quality that we have, and that's my purpose. Mm -hmm. But my my purpose is to move things forward, and if it doesn't work, then you can always go back and ask for a, a, a second chance. Because right now, without a backlog of cases, if we want to expedite certain thing, we need the attorney to move forward and do our stuff. All right, so exclusively, and you have to work with DCA if you're not helping them to move things forward we're creating an enemy in front of us, it's not going to help us. That's my opinion. But anyway, okay, any further uh, discussion from board members? I, not, I agree with Ryan. I think we should protect what we, what's belong to us. I mean, what we've got the right to do. Okay, I have a question. So, is this attorney in addition to what we have? Yes. So we are going to continue to have the attorneys we currently have, correct? It's our understanding. I don't know if, unless someone told Victor this directly, I don't know that you know that DCA Legal would still assign to board attorneys in addition to this additional attorney. I, I don't know that we know that. We, we are Is that what they told you? Yeah. Okay. That's our understanding. That's our understanding. This would be something in addition to So I apologize, I was not here on the, sep the September meeting. Oh, how, do the, how do the finances, finances? We have to pay for them regardless. So I mean, um, I, I'm just thinking about our, our you know, our, our balance sheet, and I don't know what is in cover. I'd be more concerned with the P&L and the balance sheet. But, um, <laughs> you know, if we have two, and we're gonna add another full time, that that's not a fiscal concern at all? No, we, we, we have the ability to do that. Yeah, we, we need that other person. 
So we're not talking about replacing these two. We're adding. We're talking about adding on. That's what I wanted. To say. These two. <laughs> and uh, and Josh. Yes. I think there might be more interested. The attorneys and Josh. I think there might be more interest in this proposal if it was potentially going to replace me. But <laughs> that's true. Does that answer your question, and Cheryl? Yes, I just wanted to find out if, we, if this is, is this about an additional attorney to the current attorneys that we have. Okay. Any? Oh, so I, I'm sorry, Victor. So I have another question. Okay. So this up, this attorney we're going to hire is going to be full time, only focused on the board, and will operate at our command on our stuff only. Yes, that's, what that's my understanding. Yeah. And and so we, I, I think you know, we have a concern that sometimes our great attorneys get pulled Pardon, into yeah. their No, no, no. We 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 ask them the questions. Me and Greg, we, we ask right. Them the person. If they do, then the whole uh, agreement's done. And so the difference is they're hiring this attorney from outside versus us hiring the attorney from outside. Correct. And, and the attorney's housed in their own. And they have the opportunity, if they, would, if they choose to, move the attorney somewhere else. Well, then they'd be going against their promise if they do that. Then the, all bets are off. And you know, I'm just, I'm just then, then one, we don't have to stick with our side of the agreement either. Well, I'll just say since one, one last time, because I'm going to probably move off the debate. Uh, a new administration, new rules. So, you're yeah, absolutely right. And I just want to read the last sentence from the minutes that mm -hmm. says what we were going to do that we did not do. After the motion failed, the board asked the staff to invite DCA or DCA Legal Affairs to attend the next full board meeting and provide informational presentation on this matter to the full board. Yeah, what happened with that? Um, well, they, they were going to, but then they said only the few board members, they have concerns, so they just reach out to, to you guys to answer your questions. After, after, after they, after they, they call I didn't I didn't know that they, they didn't call you, because they called, Stan, they said they called Ryan. And they did call, not call me. Oh, they, they didn't call, they didn't call me. Call me Stan, Stan called me, and uh, then he said, yeah, I, well, after I talked to them, he agreed to do the right decision. So my purpose was not no, to they, start they a discussion <laughs> about they what was done and what was not done. My purpose was to read the legal minutes and say that that's what we expected, and it did not happen. That was my sole purpose. So what, so Victor, is maybe what we need to do is, um, I, I know you want to move forward, and, and you're very, very good at keeping us focused and moving forward, but this might be a time where maybe we need to just wait at our next full board meeting, have them come and talk to us. That's going to be the end of January. That's going to be a new administration. Um, so I think maybe a couple of key things will happen in the meantime. Well, the sooner the better, but it's like with any vacancy, we have a lot of legal issues that we rely <coughs> on Laura and Kelsey to resolve. This would be ongoing workload. For example, some of our licensing decisions would be better done by an attorney than by staff. And <laughs> It would probably, in all likelihood, even if we were to decide today to do it, it would take at least that long to do it, to get somebody in the chair. Okay. If that's the case, you guys want to table it until January? I think so, because Debbie and I wasn't at the meeting, and neither one of us were contacted. Okay. <coughs> okay, is there a and maybe, motion? And, and maybe, um, let's see if we can't get them to come talk to the full board. Okay. So I think we can have them in a club, public meeting also, making those statements and commitments and it's going to be the new administration maybe that has a little bit more stickiness. Is that your motion? Is that your motion? Uh, sure. Okay, that's motion, my second. motion for David motion to table that second. until second. second by Greg. Any further discussion? No, no, by Greg, by second by Cheryl. Uh, any public discussions? Public comments? Okay, if not, uh, let's go for the vote. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. All right, motion carried. Let's move on to the next agenda item. 
licensing committee. Okay, Debbie? Okay, licensing committee. We had our last committee meeting on September 26th. Um, the licensing committee consists of myself, Stan, um, Alan, Amjad, uh, Cheryl, and Albert. And, um, the last meeting we uh, had a presentation by the uh, California Department of Corrections. They wanted to provide an overview of their new uh, clinical model that resulted in Assembly Bill 1812, which passed uh, in 2018 and became effective July 1st, 2018. It was actually a very um, good presentation. I don't think I saw the whole presentation in the packet, but um, basically what they wanted to do is they wanted to really kind of reorganize and clean up their system. Um, and so the, the changes included um, issuing clinic licenses to the, and I'm going to say CDCR, which stands for California Department of Corrections um, institutions, so that they can store drugs in various locations uh, securely and also account for the medications. Um, also, as people are transferring, prisoners are transferring between facilities, have a better continuity of care, um, so it's, it's kind of an overall kind of overhaul of how they've been um, managing the medications. Um, it's anticipated that each correctional institution, and each institution has multiple clinics or um, places where they store the medications, um, including pill lines, which are you know where the inmates line up to get their medication as long as they don't get in fights. If they get in fights and they literally, you know, go to their individual cells. Um, That's when they need more medication. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also, um, they have like, you know, different types of dental clinics and treatment and triage areas within the facility. So the presentation um, included, um, they, they went over kind of the challenges that they're currently uh, experiencing and currently what they're doing is they use these, uh, uh, the punch cards are little pill packets. And the, the problem is that if I'm in my, if I'm a prisoner there, um, either that little punch card is left with the nurse and every day I line up and get my pills punched out, or if I'm a prisoner in good standing, I actually get to have my little punch card to myself. But when you go to transfer me, um, those punch cards, my drugs probably aren't gonna go with me. Um, or they go with me and they, they're delayed by um, days, week. And you know, in some cases, that's eh, no big deal. But in a lot of cases, um, this is a big deal because the, the treatment plan is now stopped. Um, and so what they're gonna be using is they're gonna be using the um, automated drug delivery system so that uh, there won't be like a punch card just for Debbie Veal it will be um, an automated delivery system so that when I go in um, up to the, in my pill line or whatever that um, they're able to dispense the medications. Um, they also are going to have a, um, a, a, um, a electronic health record that is um, you know throughout the system which everyone's going like really? Um, but yeah that's the kind of instituting that so it's um, it's overall a great thing. It, they're going to start with um, 20, let's see, they're applying for 20 clinic licenses at each of their state correctional institutions as well as 450 to 700 automat, automated you know, ADDS systems statewide. They plan to roll out, um, including submission of the correct clinical application for the first prison to go live in August and it's anticipated they'll have it fully implemented throughout their system by 2020. Um, and the board staff is working very closely with them on making sure that they're doing all the right licenses and setting everything up correctly. Um, is there any other comment or questions? Actually, me and uh, Greg, we, last time we went to visit the Folsom State Prison, and we actually looked into how the drugs were being delivered in the, in the prison system. Right. And, and we agree, yeah, so by using the clinics and the uh, automated machine could help save a lot of money for, otherwise a lot of money would be wasted for the 
inmates being transferred out from one place to another. Uh, so th I think this is the, the right way to do it. Yeah, this is, this is a, a huge step up for um, the prisons and, and the inmates. Is there any public comment? Yeah, the, the inmates, um, we were in a cell block and uh, they, they needed their medication. <laughs> We're, we're Did you say we needed our medication? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if they would have gotten out of those cells, we would have needed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I, I'm not seeing any public comments, so I'm going to move on so we don't get any more prison jokes going. Um, next is presentation. We received a presentation by the California Department of Healthcare Services on the Los Angeles moratorium relating to new Medi-Cal numbers. Um, and this has been a very sensitive topic for um, quite a few of the licensees of pharmacy, uh, pharmacies um, in Los Angeles County. Since uh, June of 2002, um, DH, DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services, um, has put this moratorium in place. Um, they said that they did it in order to safeguard public funds and maintain the fiscal integrity of the Medi-Cal program. Um, and they reevaluate the moratorium every 180 days to assess its effectiveness and if they need to continue it. Um, this is being monitored by a, divi um, a division within DHCS called Provider Enrollment Division, otherwise known as PED. And PED then looks to the Division of Audits and Investigations Unit um, to pro be, they provide them with the information, you know, should we continue it? Audits of Investigation Unit is kind of focused on program integrity um, as well as um, they want to make sure there's not an um, access to care issue. So I'm going to skip around a little bit in here. Um, first off, why would you have to obtain a new provider? Re, uh, re-enroll uh, where this would come up. So there's eight reasons why you might need to um, reapply to DHCS in LA County. Number one is you're new. Number two is every so often you have to continue to enroll. Number three is a new additional or change in location of your pharmacy. Number four is a change in ownership. Five, 50% plus assets are sold or transferred within the ownership structure of your pharmacy. Six, you are issued a new TIN or tax identification number by the IRS. Seven, you receive a new license number issued by the Board of Pharmacy. Or eight, there's a change of 50% or more in the ownership or the controlling interest. So that's the reasons you would um, try to renew your um, your permit in LA County. So LA County then has um, 10 reasons or 10 situations where you are actually exempted and, and you do get to continue um, in your re when, when they reevaluate your, um, your application. Uh, one of the probably most contentious ones used to be if you're an independent pharmacy, you are automatically exempted and allowed to stay. That has been removed. Um, however, only, if you, only as a pharmacist owner, independent pharmacy. If it's if you're independent if pharmacist, pharmacist owned, then pharmacist you're, owned then, by, then okay. you're exempt. But they did away with that in uh, 2006. Okay, well they said in here, I think it was 16, but okay. Um, 16, so, I'm sorry, 2016. Okay, yeah, so fairly recently they did away with that. Um, if you're a chain pharmacy, you're exempt. An application based on the purchase or change of control interest of an existing Medi-Cal pharmacy is exempt, provided that um, the, the people who are buying your pharmacy retain all the debts, obligation, and liabilities of the existing provider, which is kind of a big deal. Um, applications submitted to um, uh, applications submitted pursuant to California Code of Regulations Title 22 requirement for continued enrollment is an exemption. Applications 
uh, submitted by existing Medi-Cal pharmacies for the sole, excuse me, for the sole reason of changing its location, provided that the previous business address is, was located in Los Angeles County. So if you're moving, um, you're okay, you're exempted. If you're a sole source provider, which means you're the exclusive person or entity in the United States to provide a specific product or service um, that Medi-Cal is a Medi-Cal covered benefit, you're exempted. Um, the enrollment is a county, state, or federally owned or operated pharmacy. The ap application submitted pursuant to California Code of Regulation uh, that there's no change in persons previously listed in the last complete application package that was approved or that the ownership interest totaling 5% or greater. Applicants who were enrolled solely for reimbursement of Medicare cost sharing are exempted. Applicants submitted by um, FQHCs and applicants submitted by academic specialty pharmacies. Um, and that's a, that's a new exemption. So if you go through the application process and you um, are one of those 10, then, then you are, um, your application will be renewed. In response to, uh, at, as part of the committee discussion, members expressed concern about the change in the exemption to the independent pharmacy owners. In response to this question, DHC as independently reviews each request to determine if there are other pharmacies of, uh, in existence in the area offered the same service or if the pharmacy is, is re applying for an exemption um, as a specialized pharmacy. Because one of the comment that was brought up is that a lot of independent pharmacies have a special little niche. Maybe it's a language that they provide, or maybe there's some sort of special service that they provide. And so DHCS said that they take that very seriously, and in the application package, if that's a situation, um, and the pharmacist clearly uh, details that, that they, act, they take that in, in consideration, and um, if, uh, if it's reasonable and the pharmacy meets the criteria, then they said the exemption is typically approved. During the review process, the pharmacy can continue to bill um, using their current Medi-Cal number until such request is denied or a new Medi-Cal number is attached. So in attachment two in our, um, in our uh, materials, is their um, farm healthcare services uh, presentation, it's, um, it's, it's, it's interesting, but I'm not sure that we necessarily had all of our questions answered. Um, I think the, uh, the committee is, feels a little bit torn. It's, this isn't probably necessarily a border pharmacy issue. Um, and yet we're trying to, um, you know, listen to what the licensees have to say. Um, I don't know if there's anything else uh, that we want to add. Well, I, I, I do. I do have questions. Why they did away with the exemption for pharmacists own pharmacies? Uh, well, I can, I, I their their days, I can say what their answer was. Yeah. Well, I know they 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 said about they have no oversight. Pharmacists do have oversight. They have no pharmacists. No, actually, their answer was that um, it was the um, uh, an audits and investigations unit that had recommended to them that the pharmacists owned pharmacies um, were the ones that they had concerns with, and that that's and they made the recommendation that they. Be right. Removed. So do they do they supply you with the data to, to substantiate that the that the finding shows that the pharmacists own pharmacies are all fraudulently building the system? And also, also, actually, since 2016, Medi-Cal actually doesn't cover a lot of drugs like before. In the old days, they do cover a lot of stuff. Actually, right now, they only cover a few items, like maybe uh, calcium, some cough syrup. So the amount of money is so minimum. They're talking about safeguard the money. You know, it used to be you got a, a big check from Medi-Cal patients, but now, Probably that most pharmacies only get a few thousand dollars for the for the medication that are covered by Medi-Cal right now. So you're talking about safeguard of money that is very minimal. But but even then, I, I think they, if they have all this exemption for all the other for the chain store for everyone, they, they should have that for uh, independent pharmacy also. And uh, and that only applies to LA County. What happened to the other countries? The other countries are okay. Why are we discriminating down people in LA? 
I mean, that's unfair. So we actually asked that question also. You know, why why only L.A. County, and have you seen a difference between L.A. County and like San Francisco or Sacramento? Right, I mean, we live in L.A., we do have a label in L.A. that we're bad people, and San Francisco, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, that, that's and, what I mean, okay? That's and all. so once again, they, they kind of just pointed back to the Audison Investigation Unit. It's the ones that um, had done the analysis and had come back and, and... Well, I would say show me the analysis, show me the report, okay? If you want to convince me. San Diego is okay. LA is well, not okay. LA is not okay. better pharmacists in San Diego, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we did question that, uh, Victor. <laughs> Yeah, they, they don't do it. Right? You know, I think that the, the problem is, um, the, probably the biggest problem is this isn't, um, we don't really have any authority over them. Um, you know, we can, we can question them, and, um, you know, we can discuss what they do, but um, the Board of Pharmacy doesn't have it. Well, we, we talk about, no, we do have patient access. There's certain communities that ph pharmacists the pharmacy serves special select population of people who don't speak the languages. They have to go to their independent own pharmacy. And if you don't grant them the medical number, they couldn't serve the medical patient at that location. So that's if, also the part of pharmacy jurisdiction too. If if that was the case and the independent pharmacists would include in their application that situation, then they said that they would approve it. Yeah, but they said you have to apply for the exemption. You know how long it takes for them to apply exemption? You'd be paying the rent at that time. You still um, have, you actually, they, they said that their turnaround time was pretty quick. And why wouldn't they put an exemption in the first place? There actually is. One of the exemptions is exemption number, uh, exemption number three. That is the exemption for if you have a special population. So they, they actually, they have it in there. So that, I mean, they I'm have to define to... what is a special population. <laughs> well, no, so that's what, that's what the independent pharmacist or whoever can put in there. I think I fit in that mold because I provide this. And so they don't want to try to list what this could do because you know your business. And I'm really not trying to defend them. I'm just trying to reiterate what they said. Okay. It, it says during the review process of pharmacy. I can't hear you if you're not talking into the microphone. Well, it says here in this case, you know, where you can prove it. Anyway, it says that if the explanation provided by pharmacy is reasonable, pharmacy meets the criteria, the exemption is typically approved. And during the review process, the pharmacy can continue to bill using their current medical number until such request is denied or a new medical number is issued. So if they already have a number, uh, because they were previously exempted. They can continue to do that while they're in the process of trying to uh, get a new exemption. But from new right. Exemption. New right, you just have to renew, and I don't know, that, once again, I don't know their policy, but um, you do have to renew every so often. And so when you renew and you're filling out the application, there's apparently a spot on it where you can put in, I fit this exemption because I speak Cantonese at my pharmacy and there aren't any others in this area that do. If only they think speaking Cantonese is a specialty pharmacy. It defines specific population that, it, it, we don't know what the specific population is. What's the definition? Right. Um, Danny? So this is an issue I've personally been working on uh, for ever since I started at CPHA and to kind of clarify a few things. Um, the committee did ask DHCS about the audits and investigation. Audits and investigations, we were told all their information is strictly confidential, which is part of the problem. Because they're saying, we're telling you there's a problem, but we're not showing you and we're not legally bound to show you. But we're telling you there's a problem. So that's, that's conflict number one. The other thing that I want to mention, and this is specific to why we feel this board does deserve to have some say in this, and I'm, I'm a little disappointed that the, that the report by the chair, I'm not, I'm not blaming you, Debbie, I'm just saying a little disappointed that... Well, I am did, the chair, so if you're disappointed, <laughs> okay, girl. I had, so at the committee, I presented a, a study done in 2015 by USC's School of Pharmacy uh, jointly with 
the School for Public Health Policy um, that showed that the lack of independent pharmacy specific to LA County presents a problem for medication adherence to patients, which is where I think your interests lie. And essentially what the study said was that in areas, in the more affluent areas of Los Angeles County, there's more likely to be more expensive medication of the same medication than there is in, lower, in the lower income areas. So what that means is that in the lower income areas, there's traditionally more independent pharmacies than there are perhaps some of the big box chain stores. Um, in the higher income areas, there are traditionally not as many independent pharmacies. And so the, they did a study where the price of the medication, and I believe for this particular one, uh, was there was two different, um, uh, uh, I, I think it was uh, anti, two different antibiotics. They took the, the price averages and they did individual phone calls to somewhere like 250 pharmacies. The same price was more expensive uh, in, the, in the higher income areas than the lower income areas. But what that means for you is that if this moratorium keeps going and independent pharmacies start disappearing, then that forces the lower income folks to go to the higher income areas of Los Angeles County and pay more for their medication. And there's well-established science that shows that when patients are forced to pay more for their medication than when they have been paid, they simply just don't take it. So I, I, Danny, I don't understand that connection with Medi-Cal, they don't so, pay. So, no, I understand that. But um, when there's less, a lot of chains in, in LA County don't participate in Medi-Cal. Some do, but some don't. And so there's less options, there's less access for lower individual, lower income individuals. At some point through their, and, and again, I don't have the study here, I probably should have brought the study here for, and presented each of you a copy. But what they said is over a period of time, they're gonna end up paying about 35% more, uh, uh, whether you're paying, if you're paying, if you're paying as, a, as, a, as an individual. Um, but in this case, because they're Medi-Cal, the state's gonna pay more because the, the state is essentially paying for their, for their medication as a Medi-Cal patient. So what I'm saying is that whether you're paying in, as an indiv individual person or whether, you're, whether the state's paying for you for Medi-Cal, the absence of independent pharmacies because of this moratorium in LA County will eventually raise the cost of medications uh, for lower income people. And, they, and that's what this study proved. And I think I, if, if you have the, the study and the information, uh, why don't you bring it back? Let's, we can bring, talk about it at the, uh, at the licensing committee again. The, only, the only thing I um, <coughs> want to just mention is what Medi-Cal pays for that antibiotic is the same regardless of where the pharmacy is. Because we all use the same NDC number, and that means the same AWP, and that means the same price. But I, I think that there is potentially an access issue, and perhaps by the access route, we can, um, you know, maybe, maybe that is our goal. Yeah, um, and I should mention, you know, for, for those of you who are not too familiar with this issue, this was supposed to be a temporary moratorium. Yeah. Um, this moratorium started in 2002. Um, in, your, in your packets, it says that this moratorium is set to expire in a few days. Uh, we fully don't believe that that's going to happen at all. In fact, it's almost automatically renewed as a matter of more of a knee-jerk reaction. We've made inquiries to the Department of Healthcare Services about why this is continually needed. Their argument, frankly, of uh, that to, to, to maintain the fiscal integrity of the program, is, in my opinion, I'm just going to say it, it's garbage. Because there are so many other problems within Medi-Cal that are you know, causing prices to rise. But as, as was mentioned, why LA County? Why not other, there's 57 other counties. And frankly, there are other counties where opioid problems are even a bigger problem, uh, more in the rural areas. What's, what's so special about LA County? Uh, well, I, I could imagine that when they have non-pharmacist owner before and certain retail yes. pharmacies, there's some abuse for to win cases, but that's non pharmacist owners. And I talk about pharmacist owners. That yeah, and, and there was, according to, I mean, I, as I was researching the issue when I, when I was first brought on board, yes, there was a problem with, you know, run by night pharmacies that would disappear in three months. Right. 
And, and I think when you attack those types of issues, that's fine. But just for them to say that there is the same problem with, independent, with pharmacists on pharmacies, and just telling us that that's the same problem without showing us any data, I, I'm, I'm, calling, I'm calling their bluff on that. So in any event, like I said, I, I think for, for purposes of this board, and we'll, we'll discuss more at the licensing meeting, but for purposes of this board getting involved in this program, um, I, I think uh, you will see that medication adherence is, is, is a concern that the board should have. And if there are less independent pharmacies that are resulting from this moratorium, I think that's cause for concern. Thank you, Dan. Any other public comments? Go on, David. Okay. Um, the next item on, a, is, uh, on our agenda is um, we discussed uh, the requirements for pharmacists to pass continuing education course related to pharmacy law. And as you may recall, um, we have, um, well, it comes back to the board's one hour webinar, which is available on our website for one hour of CE. And this uh, meets the two hours of, two of the 30 hours of CE required for the pharmacist's license renewal will be completed by participating in a board certified CE course of law and ethics. Now the good news is, as of September 12, 2018, 1,542 pharmacists have completed the online webinar. So that's fantastic that it's being used. Um, probably the not so good news is, is it's supposed to take about an hour and um, in reviewing it we found in many instances people were fast forwarding through and completing it in 10 minutes. Um, we also found that people, um, you know, answered the questions all wrong. Um, so they weren't really gaining competency from the CE and if there's anything that CE is about, it's about making us better pharmacists, more competent pharmacists. And it seems like we were, um, well, the World Series starts tonight. We were, we were kind of striking out on this. <laughs> oh, you like that? Go Dodgers. Um, anyway. <laughs> I like that a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> um, so during the committee meeting, we thought, gosh, you know, we need to, we need to do something. And so, of course, we're a government body, so it's like, it's right a regulation. But um, our staff is smarter than us, and um, we asked them to kind of look into this and figure out you know, how we can write a regulation and what should we do, and what they actually found out is uh, technology can fix it. And so specifically, we're, going, we're working with um, solid training group within DCA who um, can basically slow down the webinar, make you answer questions correctly, um, so that we can do our darndest to try to make people more confident and understand what they're reading, um, and make sure that they actually are paying attention and, and going through. So the motion that we have here that came from the staff was to direct, I mean, that came from the committee, was to well, actually, this isn't exactly what came from the committee, so Cheryl, I might need you to second it. Um, but we want to direct staff to work with the DCA Solid Training Group and Office of Information Services to incorporate changes within the online webinar to prevent a person from completing the webinar if the licensee answers questions specific to the content of the webinar incorrectly. So I'll, I'll just divert just for a second. Our motion to the staff was actually to write a regulation, and, and because of their good work, we don't need to do a regulation, we can fix it with technology. So uh, this is the motion I'd like to propose. And I'll second. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if there's any um, discussion from board members. I see Steve, you're itching to get up there. <laughs> uh, Steve Gray, a pharmacist. Um, one of the things that was discussed at the licensing committee was um, establishing a passing score. Was that no longer necessary? Um, yeah. We also discussed that at communication education. I think you'll, you'll hear about it in that committee. But okay. in this one, yeah, we decided that we're just going to slow them down, make them make sure that they take the you know read take the course and the prescribed amount of time and pass the questions. So if they don't pass the question, you can't go forward. 
Okay. So, um, and, that, and we're familiar with that technology. It's uh, used in, in a lot of the compliance industry for employees. Uh, one of the problems uh, that was identified by a conference a couple of years ago in Chicago by ACPE, uh, National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, and others participated was that, uh, I hate to say it, but there was a lot of cheating going on with webinar, correspondence, and other type of uh, courses that were not proctored. And um, one of the things that slowing it down does not do is uh, it just takes you longer to get the uh, answers from another pharmacist who did it. Uh, and so you can watch TV and take an hour, and when it comes to ask a question, you, you, you just give the answer that the other person got. So one of the recommendations uh, coming from technology at that conference was, is there a way, um, and I don't know if you can, but that you can have enough variability across the population of 44,000 pharmacists that need to take this course or attend a live session uh, that you can prevent this sharing of answer sheets and therefore uh, uh, prevent the, the cheating that is well documented that goes on with journal articles, webinars, and other types of continuing education. The conclusion at the end of that conference was that the profession, maybe all professions, need to move away from uh, those types of courses and tests into a CPD, Continual Professional Development. So I would think that one of the things that still needs to be discussed is the policy issue of whether we really believe that th this type of webinar, unproctored uh, education course and test testing really accomplishes what is set out to do. And, and I think there's ample evidence if you reach out to those organizations to say it probably is, is, does not accomplish it, whether it's law, clinical, or otherwise. So I hate to say that, but I mean, they were, they were giving numbers like 60 to 80 percent of the uh, CE granted uh, through non-in-person proctored exams was probably fraudulent. Okay. Well, I think step one is we'll try to work with a solid training group and see what we can do. And I'm not sure they're going to be psychometrically, you know, enabled, but um, we'll see what they can do. Is there any other? Thank you for your comments. Is there any other public comment? Mr. President, can I call for the yeah, vote? Call for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carried. Okay, now moving on to um, continuing education requirement for advanced practice pharmacists. That includes the option for an inactive status or advanced practice pharmacist license. So as everyone knows, we started uh, licensing advanced, advanced practice pharmacists. Um, we started accepting applications in December 13th of 2016. And shortly thereafter, in 2017, we began issuing licenses. Um, an advanced practice pharmacist is required to complete an additional 10 hours of continuing education each renewal cycle, in addition to the 30 hours required for the pharmacist renewal. So what we've found is that the advanced practice pharmacists, we do not have the authority to issue an inactive license under specific situations um, like we can with the regular pharmacists. Um, so if, a, um, if an advanced practice pharmacist doesn't do their CE or um, when we audit them they don't have CE, we currently don't have the authority to inactivate their advanced practice pharmacist. Oops. Um, so we kind of need to fix it. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, we thought about. Number one is um, pharmacists, just a regular pharmacist license, are exempt from earning CE during their first renewal cycle. A similar provision does not exist in the advanced practice pharmacist. And the staff noted that advanced practice pharmacist expiration date is issued coterminous with their primary pharmacist license, and as such, the license may not receive a full two years during their first renewal cycle of their advanced practice pharmacists. So we wanted to address that. 
Um, and basically what our proposal is, we're going to address it by saying for the advanced practice pharmacists, the first two years, just like with the regular pharmacists, they don't have to do CE. <laughs> The board has the authority to issue an in inactive pharmacist license to an individual that has not satisfied CE requirements. Staff notice this ability applies when either the pharmacist fails to provide satisfactory proof as part of a renewal or in response to an audit. A similar provision does not exist for advanced practice, so we are <coughs> proposing to add that. Provisions exist to establish the process to reactivate pharmacist license, however, no similar process to reactivate advanced practice pharmacist license exists, so we need to fix that. <coughs> and lastly, pharmacists are required to retain their CE certificates for four hours, excuse me, for four years. <laughs> but there is no similar requirement for the advanced practice pharmacist. Likewise, we need to fix that. So if you look at attachment four, which is on page 38, you will see that we have added, or the staff has proposed, um, some language, 1732.55, regarding the renewal requirements for the advanced practice pharmacists. Um, an applicant for renewal advanced practice pharmacist license shall maintain a current and active pharmacist license and shall submit all the following as part of the renewal. Application and payment for the renewal fee. Submit proof, of satisfact proof satisfactory to the board that the license has, licensee has completed 10 hours of continuing education. This is in addition to the continuing education required necessary for the pharmacist renewal. Notwithstanding subdivision A, the board shall not require completing com completion of continuous education for the first renewal cycle of the advanced practice pharmacists. So like I mentioned, we're going to waive it the first go round. The board may issue an inactive advanced practice pharmacist license under any of the following conditions. The pharmacist license becomes inactive, so the base pharmacist license is inactive. The licensee fails to provide documentation of completion of the required continuing education. As part of an investigation or an audit conducted by the board, an advanced practice pharmacist fails to provide documentation substantiating the completion of continuing education is required. An inactive licensed practice pharmacists may only be reactivated by paying the renewal fee due <clears throat> and submitting satisfactory proof to the board that the licensee has completed the 10 hours and is confirmed has met all the licensure renewal requirements. Lastly, an advanced practice pharmacist shall retain documentation of completion of continuing education for four years following completion. So it's just a little cleanup to kind of sync pharmacists and uh, advanced practice pharmacists. So the committee um, motion is, so I do, do not need a second, is direct staff to, in concert with council, develop language for the board's consideration to align the advanced practice pharmacist renewal requirements with the renewal requirements for the pharmacists. Uh, is there any board comment? Public, Steve. Public comments. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Steve Gray, the pharmacist. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear you say was that um, and, uh, that the ten hours of CE for the advanced practice license has to be in subject matter specific to their area of advanced practice, and um, you you may want to consider making that part of the regulation to remind them. I think that's already in there, isn't it? It's, it's, a statutory. Statutory. it's in the yeah, statute. That, that's already in there. This is, this is just a section specific around renewal, but in the section where it talks about the CE, I think it already says Right, that. but what, what you said is that regulation is going to say this is what you have to submit, and you detailed it very. I think it would behoove the process to also remind them of what's in the statute. Or Unfortunately, they may not go back to the statute and realize that it has to be in their area of practice. But it also raises the issue, how are you going to know what their area of practice is when you get it? So I don't know, maybe on audit you'll do it, or, or I don't know. But um, the board doesn't have any information on the area of practice that's not submitted. Uh, I don't think it's submitted with your advanced practice pharmacist license or what they're doing at that time. Because the advanced practice pharmacist license is a threshold 
uh, requirement. Once you've got that, you can change your, your category of practice without going back to the board. So you may want to add that uh, specificity into that particular regulation. Okay, I don't think that changes our motion, but maybe staff and council can take that into consideration when you... And I think, I think you could actually request, you, what are the 10 units that you took to renew in a specialty area to renew your advanced practice license? Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't think it requires something specific. And the Office of Administrative Law does not like us to duplicate in regulation things that already exist in statute. You're expected to be able to apply the law. Yeah, I think with respect to the content area, we'll catch that as part of the audit. Um, although we drafted the language as regulation, the board is going to be pursuing statutory changes. If the board agrees with the policy, would they also be agreeable to us considering to do this via statute as opposed to regulation? If we find a, a legislative vehicle, it might go a little bit faster. Yeah. So, so do it as a statute would be faster than do it as a regulation? It could be. If we're able to find a vehicle, it might go, it might go faster. And so then if we can't, can we go back and just do the regulation? Absolutely. Because you're approving the language and give us the flexibility to determine whether or not it's a regulation or a statute. Right. So that's actually not part of the motion right now. Yes. So my question would be to the board, do you feel uh, comfortable that you want to proceed in that direction? Because I think at the time the, the committee saw it, you didn't have draft language right. in front of you. So are you, do you want it to come back to the board one more time? Uh, in regulatory board, or do you want to? I would think that we that want to go ahead and direct the. Let's go ahead. My recommendation is that we go ahead and, and direct the staff to do this, vote on the motion, right. and then if we want to do a second motion to to have the staff check on a statutory vehicle, yeah. then, then we do that at the second motion. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, we do it all as one motion. Uh, except the recommendations and allow I mean, is this staff. what the committee wants? We, I mean, we can't, I, I, we can't amend well, it. So we, we would have to vote it down. Yeah, and gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think we, let's approve this and then we yeah. can. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, can you um, Yeah, okay, this, this is just to vote on the committee recommendation. So this motion yes. is just for the committee recommendation. Correct. Okay, so any further discussion, public comments? If not, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, now you can bring up a second motion. Uh, Ryan, would you like to make a motion? Sure, I'd like to make a motion and then to allow staff to follow the state legislature, <coughs> see if they can find a legislative vehicle to uh, attach this uh, language in. Second. Second by Greg. Um, would you also be amenable to authorizing that if, if they're unable to do that, that we they can begin the process of drafting the formal right package? But that's what we they approved. Already have, they already have that. Yeah. That's what we've approved. Um, uh, I don't think that's what the committee's motion was. Okay. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll make my motion to allow uh, staff to start crafting the regs. I'll accept that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any public comments? Yes. All right. I'll second that, Greg. Okay. Thank you. Um, Steve Gray again. It, as I understand it, because this is um, this is not going to be required um, for the first cycle of renewals, uh, you know, does that take into consideration whether you're going to go legislative or regulatory, and, and maybe it doesn't matter. But isn't there also the possibility of doing both simultaneously and then uh, having a better chance of meeting the, the requirement? Uh, that's what we just did. Over running parallel. Well, it sounded like I think I heard that if that doesn't work, then you'd go back to try and do a regulation. So, right. and is there a way to do it at the same time? It seems yeah. like we have to, you know, do one or the other. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can go, you go parallel tracks. If the board would be, as I understand the motion, the motion was to authorize uh, the board staff to pursue either a statutory or a regulatory change uh, that is consistent with the language that you have. Right in attachment four. So it's a dual track. So from, from a practical standpoint, the effort for a regulation is significantly more than a statutory change. And we should know very early into the, the beginning of next year, if not the end of this year, whether or not we'll have an author. If we're unable to secure an author early in the year, then we'll start the rulemaking process. Running the dual track 
we can do it, but there's significant reviews that need to occur, both once it leaves the board's office through the DCA review and then the formal pre-review. Um, so the process is quite significant if we could, it's a lot faster if we can just find an author. So we'd like it to be- So you don't want to go track? Um, if we could have two months and then look, make a decision, I think that would be preferable. Well, can we just keep the, the, um, the motion he made and you can just handle it that way? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. I believe the motion was broad enough to allow that okay. it to be implemented in that way. Exactly. So you, the board would, if it votes in favor of the motion, it would allow the staff to determine whether or not to to try either statutory or regulatory changes okay. to implement text consistently. Okay, good yeah. idea. Mr. Yeah. President, can okay. you call for a vote? Sure. So motion by uh, Ryan and second by Greg. Uh, any further public discussion or comment? If not, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carried. Okay, um, next agenda item is regarding um, fees for duplicate license or updating license record information. Um, BPC section 4400N establishes the fee for the board to reissue a license certificate at the request of a licensee when a license has been lost or destroyed or due to a name change. The current fee to reissue a license is $45. Also, Section O establishes a fee for the board to reissue a license when there has been a, any change in license information. The current fee to reissue such a change is $100. Examples that might trigger um, a change in license information, I'm sure this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are potential triggers, is um, 4307, establishing the board's authority to prohibit someone from serving as a manager, administrator, owner, member, officer, director, associate, partner, or any other person with management and control under specified conditions. Section 4101 establishes requirements for notification of change in a pharmacist in charge or designated representative in charge. CCR section 1709 establishes the reporting requirement for an entity to notify the board of specified changes, including changes in owners, officers, and pharmacists in charge. Similar reporting requirements exist throughout pharmacy law of entities licensed by the board. The committee considered the proposal from the staff that would amend BPC 4400 to provide clarity and transparency regarding the fees collected and the purpose for which the fee is collected. Under the, under the current construct, all reported changes are processed and either approved or denied under the board's authority. In all such instances, when such a change is approved, the entity receives a new license. The committee noted that the confusion with the current statutory language and consider questions from the public about events that would trigger new printed board license to be issued. So the committee recommendation is to direct staff to work with legal counsel to develop language for the board consideration to update the law to provide more clarity on the fee to be updated, the fee to update the license record and the reissuance of a printed license certificate. So if you look at, um, see it's attachment uh, five, um, you can see the change under 4400 fees uh, it says the fee for processing of an application to change information on a premises license record shall be $100. So we're not changing the dollar amount, we're just adding that clarification of verbiage. That was a committee motion, so it does not need a second. Is there any other board discussion? Public? Mr. President? Okay, uh, no public comment. In that case, uh, this is the uh, committee recommendation. So all those in favor, please raise your hand.
Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carried. And I also just want to note that um, because there were a lot of questions about this during the committee meeting, uh, we are planning on developing an FAQ that will appear in the script in a future issue. Um, Moving on it, to the next. Excuse uh, me, Madam Chair, it's Laura. Where's that come from? Uh, May I assume uh, that with this uh, motion as well as the other motion that there is a certain amount of discretion given to uh, your staff to sort of uh, make some technical changes to the language? Yeah, I think that that was the intent of the committee. Okay. But thank you for clarifying for me. The next is um, discussion, discussion around amending Business and Professions Code Section 4115.5 regarding pharmacist technician training externship hour requirements. That section allows an individual to work in the pharmacy as a pharmacy technician trainee um, as long as specific conditions are met. Um, and as such, there are limitations on number of hours the technician, can, the technician trainee can actually work which includes a minimum of 120 hours experience in a work site, as well as a total maximum of 320, so they can have multiple uh, work site experiences. Um, BPC section 4202 establishes a general requirement for licensure as a pharmacy technician. Further, section A2 provides that one of the pathways to licensure is completion of a training course specified by the board. Uh, CCR section 1793-6A expands upon such training courses and designates a pharmacy technician training program accredited by the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, ASHP, as one such training course approved by the board. Okay, this is important because ASHP accredits pharmacy technician training programs, requires 130 hours of technician <coughs> training at each location which exceeds the 120 hours that we, that's currently established. This results in a conflict between the ASHP accredited pharmacy training program, which is what we point to, and our pharmacy law. <coughs> um, further, the current limitation on the maximum number of hours a pharmacy technician training can gain is 320 hours, which prevents an individual from meeting the elements for advanced level training under the ASHP guidelines. Advanced level training must include at least 340 hours. If you remember, we had um, 320. So during our meeting, we, we discussed this <coughs> and the conflict um, with the ASHP pharmacy training and came up with the following recommendation or motion. Direct staff to work with council to develop language for the board's consideration to modify section 4115.5C1 uh, to amend the language to read no less than 120 hours and no more than 140 hours, as well as to amend 4115.5C2 to increase 320 hours to 340 hours and remove the last sentence in the subdivision. And that last sentence said, um, uh, no more than 120 of the 320 hours may be completed in a community pharmacy setting or in a single department in a hospital pharmacy. So we found that was redundant and not needed. So we um, were, are recommending that that be removed. Um, so C1, now it says, except as described in paragraph two, an externship in which a pharmacy technician trainee is participating as described, subdivision A, shall be for a period of no less than 120 hours and no more than 140 hours. Uh, two, when an externship in a pharmacy technician trainee is participating as described in subdivision A, involving rotation between a community and a hospital pharmacy for the purpose of training the student, in distinct practice settings, the externship may be for a period of up to 340 hours. Those are the changes that we are uh, anticipating that staff will work with the council to make. Is there any board comment? Public. I look at 
Steve first. <laughs> um, Mr. President? Okay, seeing none, uh, then this is the uh, committee recommendation, the motion. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? And motion carried. Okay. <clears throat> Next section is um, advanced practice pharmacists to provide medical assistant treatment, which is also known as MAT it's in the notes here. In the, midst, <coughs> excuse me, in the midst of the huge nationwide opioid crisis, one of the recommended solutions to address the crisis is to provide medication assistant treatment to help wean patients from opioids. There are three main medications used for this, methadone, Gosh, I always get this wrong. Um, say it again. How I say it again? Buprenorphine. There's like one like syllable there. I think that may be that. Buprenorphine and naltrexone. Alan, how come you're not making fun of her pronunciation? <laughs> because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Um, <coughs> pharmacists are medication specialists, they don't always know how to say the word, but they are, um, who are skilled in the assessment and management of substance-related disorders such as opioid addiction. Today's pharmacists have six to eight years of college education with a focus experience in performing medication management. Increasingly, this also includes additional residency experience. Under California law, for a number of years, and in conjunction with collaborative practice agreements with prescribers, Pharmacists have the ability to design treatment plans, initiate medication, monitor patient progress, order review necessary lab tests, coordinate care, and serve as expert cons consultants to support prescribers in making medication decisions for patients with opioid addiction and co-occurring conditions. This skill set serves as a dual purpose of positioning pharmacists so they may provide a direct care to patients with opioid addiction and assist other medical providers in caring for the, this population, therefore expanding access to care. Additionally, in California, pharmacists with appropriate education and experience may secure an additional pharmacist license that is advanced practice pharmacists. So there is a barrier. Although pharmacists in many states may prescribe controlled substance under a collaborative practice agreement, they are not eligible to obtain the federal DATA 2000 waiver to prescribe buprenorphine for opioid addiction. Under federal regulation, only physicians, nurse practitioners, and physicians assistants can obtain this authority. Having this authority would allow them to fully exercise their pharmaceutical expertise in this area and expand the proof, um, the pool of providers for medication assistance programs. So the committee just, um, during our committee meeting, we spoke of um, trying to support the addition of pharmacists to the group of healthcare prof um, providers who can obtain a DATA 2000 waiver. Members of the public spoke in support of adding pharmacists to the group of healthcare professionals, and it was recommended that when drafting the policy statement, the committee focus on seeking approval for pharmacists to provide MAP. Um, rather than listing specific medications. Um, so in, 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 instead of just listing the three medications, just say we, be, um, we provide medication assistance treatment. This approach would ensure that if new medications became available, pharmacists could provide them. The committee directed the staff to work on development of a policy statement, a draft policy statement, supporting the role of the pharmacist in providing MAP services. Further, the committee requested staff to develop options for advocating change in federal law to allow such services to occur. <clears throat> Both items will be brought to the committee at its next meeting. So this is, um, you know, just for your information, it'll probably come back around. Um, but we are going, we are asking the staff to develop, develop a policy statement on behalf of the Board of Pharmacy that uh, pharmacists should be able to be one of these team members and be able to prescribe buprenorphine. Are there any um, board comments? Well, to, I totally agree. They allow NP, PA, and they wouldn't allow pharmacists into it. So yeah, it's something crazy. they should pursue. Public comment? 
Um, in the notes, the next section is our strategic goals, uh, which we've already reviewed. Uh, so then we get to licensing statistics, and I'm not going to go through them, but there's um, you know, quite a bit of licensing information and also details provided in attachment nine. Um, you know, I guess it just shows how hardworking our staff is. Um, I know that uh, licensing at times it takes a little bit longer than we plan on, and I do know that there's been a all hands on deck to try to get that uh, resolved. I don't know, Jenny, if you have anything you want to add to our licensing time, dating time? I, yeah, I think you've summed it up pretty well. I think that if anyone has a problem, they're welcome to give me a call, and I'll do what I can for a new roadblock. Sometimes apps get stalled, and I'll be happy to resolve where I can. But, um, we're, we're completing the um, onslaught of pharmacists and interns. It's the double whammy um, where people that graduate in June and interns that come to start school in August hit us both and we've got one person each to do those functions and so it's been a little busy. But we intend to continue to work at it. It's like our enforcement program. It's part of what we do and we have to measure against it. Thank you. Um, is there any comments from the board members on our licensing statistics? Public? Um, last item in our uh, agenda is future committee dates, um, which are listed December 19, 2018, April 3, 2019, June 26, 2019, and October 2, 2019. We um, always appreciate stakeholders attending. It's a uh, usually a very interesting meeting, but we need you to give us feedback so we can make sure we do the right things. And it's not a classroom, so I'll let you just come forward. <laughs> I just want to ask, why, how come those committee meetings can't be uh, um, webcast? Staff issues with the Department of Consumer Affairs. <laughs> the lovely DCA. They have, to cover, they have to cover the board meetings for all the boards. Well, I know, but you know. They just well, aren't they've doing had, it. They've lost one of their staff that takes well to replace, and so. Well, boo hoo. Another <laughs> 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 advocacy for let's podcast more. Is that what that was? <laughs> okay, Mr. President, that's my report. All right, thank you very much, Debbie, for your hard work. And uh, let's move on to one more committee meeting before we take the break for today. The Communication and Public Ed Committee. Uh, Ricardo, Mr. Okay. Chair. Uh, the Communication and Public Education Committee met October 11, 2018. Uh, we had a discussion of a proposal by the Chapman University School of Pharmacy Group to require a warning label uh, prescription uh, container, containers for chemotherapy medications. That's on your attachment one. It seems to be a little too close. A um, little background on that. At the March 2017 committee meeting, students and faculty from Chapman University School of Pharmacy presented their research uh, about proper handling and disposal of oral chemotherapy medications. The group proposed requiring a standardized hazard symbol on prescription labels for NIOSH designated hazardous drugs. Uh, the group returned at the September 2017 committee meeting and presented earlier findings of, sur of a survey of healthcare professionals on the use and handling of oral chemotherapy drugs. The group also said it was, a, uh, was preparing a similar survey for patients. Uh, our committee's discussion at the October 11th committee meeting uh, Chapman faculty and students presented additional survey findings. A copy of their uh, slide presentation is on uh, attachment over there uh, with your folders. The students surveyed 24 pharmacists and 12 patients about their knowledge, awareness, and practices in handling and di uh, disposing of oral chemotherapy drugs. In summary, the findings indicated an important need for more education in these areas for pharmacists and patients. Committee members expressed concern about the lack of public awareness and education uh, re revealed by the surveys. The committee suggested larger surveys with more respondents are needed to, do, to uh, better understand the scope of the problem and possible solutions. You know, there's 24 pharmacists, 12 uh, you know, patients, we just didn't think it was you know, enough of a pull out there. 
the students were urged to focus on increasing awareness and education about safe handling and drug disposal uh, rather than seeking a mandated requirement for adding a hazardous symbol on prescription labels. Committee members also suggested advocates work with pharmacists uh, pharmacies that are willing to voluntarily add the hazard symbol to prescription labels. Um, the uh, committee also directed staff to develop a possible policy statement by the board about proper handling and disposal of oral chemotherapy drugs. Staff will draft proposed language and return to the committee uh, to review. Uh, update on the proposal for public, uh, and first of all, any, Public comment? Okay. You know, Ricardo, I'd just, I just like to add so one thing, know. and I think it was that we kind of challenged the students that they need to get more surveys. Yeah, we needed more participants. You know, the 24 uh, pharmacists and 12 patients just wasn't enough. And this has been going on for like, what, two years? Yeah, it's been a while. So, you know, we're, we encouraged them to go back out and uh, try to get more uh, individuals to uh, participate in their survey. Just the the scary thing is with the 24 pharmacists that they did survey, yeah. um, it was extremely, um, I can't think of a better word than scary, yeah. the lack of knowledge of, um, of how to handle these, these medications. And the other thing that was interesting is they found the students right out of school and then the people who had been in practice a really long time, so I don't know, maybe they've taken a bunch of CE or something, they were like the two groups who knew how to handle the chemo drugs, and all the people in the middle, like, did horrible. Like, they didn't know what to do. Um, so it was, I thought it was very interesting. And if you look in the presentation, it's there. Uh, any more questions or from the board? Sir? Move on. Update on the proposal for a public uh, service billboard message and related communications materials on prescription drug abuse. That's on your attachment two. Uh, a little background. Upfront Media is donating five bulletin boards to the Board of Pharmacy for a public service message about prescription drug abuse. The committee approved a design created by board staff and chose use, don't abuse as the message theme. Uh, the board reviewed the design uh, and, and message in February 2018. A copy of the billboard is on your attachment too, so the board can look at it. Uh, some of our discussion on our October 11th uh, committee meeting, uh, staff reported that a no-cost contract for five billboards has been sent out to Outfront Media for approval and signature. As of, uh, as of October 11th, the board was waiting for Outfront uh, to respond. Uh, the committee directed staff to ask out front how long it would take to get the billboards printed where and where they will be erected. Committee members uh, said staff should use data on the drug abuse to identify locations where the signs would be most effective. The executive officer said, uh, Virginia Herald, uh, said staff would try to get more information for the October board <coughs> meeting and uh, I think she has an update, right? I have a brief update. I'd like to thank Mr. Brooks for again offering these billboards. We've got five of them. Um, my understanding is that we're, there are only so many roadblocks there can be to get any project off the ground, and we're about at the end of that. Um, right now, we're waiting to hear back from out front whose attorneys have to sign off on it before it can be signed off on by our attorneys one last time. And then I think that's it. There's, like I said, there's only so many impediments. So I think, again, we need to thank Outfront Media for doing this, or CP. What is the proper name, Mr. Brooks? Uh, Outfront Media. Outfront Media for um, the billboards. We're ready to put them out, so, you know, as soon as we, as soon as we can get this last hurdle done, we're set. <coughs> but it's taken way too long. It does be frustration. Yeah, and, and I was just asked a moment ago, I don't know if anyone heard, that um, we were asked to have to provide competing bids for a zero dollar contract, which means it wasn't going to cost us anything. Yeah. And, and so that, that impediment was ultimately removed, but without us having to supply additional bids. But sometimes you just got to pull people up from what they're doing and make them think a little bit. 
Okay. So we hope to have this done shortly. Yeah, we'll have we'll have to we'll update the board as, as hopefully they'll see the field boards as you yeah. go too much before as you're driving you get on. Yeah. Look at it. Um, moving on. Discussion of ed educational materials regarding drug take back collection receptacles and providing public access to such information. A little background. In June 2017, the board adopted uh, regulations for pharmacies and clinics to establish prescription drug take back services. In July 2017, the board directed staff to develop consumer information on accessing the drug take back programs. At the February 2018 board meeting, staff demonstrated an online search tool being developed to help consumers find locations for collection receptacles by city, zip code, or pharmacy uh, name. Uh, some of our discussion at our October 11th committee meeting, staff uh, gave a brief demonstration of the completed online search tool on the board website. A total of 233 receptacle locations were registered with the board as of September 25th, 2018. The new search tool includes only take back locations that are registered with the board. It is not comprehensive, it's not a comprehensive list of all take back locations in California. Staff noted that the board website includes links to search tools for take back locations operated by the DEA, uh, Don't Rush to Flush, and the California Department of Public Health. Staff also reported the Department of Public Health has received $3 million uh, to fund grants to pharmacies for drug take back services. The first grants could be awarded as soon as this month. Uh, in addition, the governor signed uh, SB uh, 212, which requires manufacturers and distributors of drugs or sharps uh, to form stewardship programs to operate and pay for take back programs for drug and sharps. The law required, required, requires calorie cycle to promulgate regulations to implement the law by January 1st, 2021. A copy of SB 212 is part of your uh, attachment. Um, staff advised the committee that the board will be involved with Cal Recycle in developing regulations for SB 212. Staff also said the new law will not change the board's current take back regulations. Any questions from the board? Public? Okay, we'll move on. Update on the development of webinar course uh, to satisfy the education requirement for pharmacists to furnish naloxone. Background, uh, naloxone, a prescription drug that reverses opiate overdose, is one of the most effective tools for preventing overdose deaths from opioids. California law authorizes pharmacists to furnish naloxone to patients pursuant to protocol adopted by the board in California Code of Regulations, Article 16, Section 1746.3. The protocol requires pharmacists to complete one hour training in an uh, approved CE course before they can begin furnishing naloxone. Uh, in February 2018, the board approved recommendations by this committee to create a webinar course that will satisfy the naloxone training requirement. Pharmacists will be able to access the course on the board's website at their convenience. Uh, some of our discussion on our October 11th committee meeting, uh, staff reported DCA's solid unit is finalizing the voiceover and closed captioning. In addition, staff has asked Solid to set up the webinar to prevent users from fast forwarding through the video to the quiz at the end. The webinar is expected to be completed and available on the website in October. Can't believe people would do that. Let's see, staff said the webinar quiz does not require a passing score. Instead, if a user chooses the wrong answer, the quiz indicates the answer is incorrect and shows the correct answer. Staff note, noted the licensing committee is looking into a possible requirement for users to earn a passing score on webinars. In addition, staff is technically, uh, is said technically could be used to prevent fast forwarding and to improve future versions of the board's uh, webinars. Staff also noted the webinar is intended mainly to help pharmacists keep the training requirement for furnishing naloxone but the board may wish to offer CE uh, as well to pharmacists who uh, complete the course. 
In public uh, comment, it was Danny Martinez of uh, CPHA said the Department of Health Care Services is expected to begin reimbursing uh, Medi-Cal pharmacists for services performed under SB 493, as well as furnishing naloxin on April 1st, 2019. Any questions for the board? Public? Okay, we move on. Discussion of a pro of proposal to establish a uh, establish a Twitter account for the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, a little background, the board's 2017-2021 strategic plan calls for the board to identify and use additional resources for public and licensee uh, outreach services. Uh, some of our discussion at our October 11th committee meeting, staff proposed using Twitter as a communication tool for outreach to the public. It was noted that the board currently has several channels for communicating directly with licensees, including subscriber alerts, the newsletter, site inspections, etc., but uh, none that is widely ac accessible or known to the general public. Staff gave a brief PowerPoint presentation about how the board could use Twitter effectively to reach and uh, engage consumers directly, reach news media, deliver timely information immediately, uh, create links with other organizations, promote public awareness of the board's activities and brand, increase public awareness and support for the board's mission and activities. Staff also discussed types of information the board could communicate to the public via Twitter, including upcoming board meetings and events, recalls, regulations, news re releases, and links to consumer resources. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation is in uh, the board's uh, package, uh, attachment number four. Uh, the committee expressed support for using Twitter as a communication channel with the public. Members noted that millions of Americans currently rely on Twitter to receive news and information, mostly on their cell phones rather than traditional news media. Twitter messages also can easily be sent out in multiple languages. Uh, the committee asked about using other social media in addition to Twitter, such as Facebook and Instagram. Staff recommended starting with Twitter because it's, e it's uh, easiest to use. In addition, staff could collect and present data on its effectiveness to help the board determine whether to add other social media accounts. In public comments, speakers said they supported the board using Twitter, but expressed concerns about how the board would handle hostile messages that target licensees or other uh, individuals. Speakers also asked that private messages sent on Twitter would be subject to Public Records Act requests. Council said these issues would require legal research. Uh, committee's recommendation recommend that the board approve the establishment and use of a Twitter account to communicate with the public and direct staff to report on its usage in the committee's quarterly report to the board. In addition, direct staff to research other social media for possible use. That's the recommendation. Any questions from the board? Any public comments? Public comments? So um, I was one of the individuals who asked about the concerns um, on uh, whether the, the private messages are subject to the Public Records Act. I'm just curious if, there, if there's been any legal research, if there's any answer to that, any follow-up um, prior to you guys actually voting on this motion. I'm just wondering if there's been any legal research on that. It's ongoing. I mean, it would, it would fall under the category of a record, obviously, that the, right. the agency has control over. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of it, any exception to that, but we are looking into it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question along those lines. You know, probably with email, we have a you know, retention policy. With a Twitter account, you don't have a retention policy. And so it's something you might want to you know, think about as we're looking at these rules. Yeah, I mean, I'll mention, I, when I worked in the legislature, I ran a Twitter account for a member of the legislature um, before social media was, was a big thing. Um, and I know that in the legislature, and, and obviously it works differently in the legislature, but legislative council at the time were saying there are different rules for Twitter if you're using your personal account versus an official 
uh, assembly or senate account. Um, and so uh, it was, as somebody who, who ran the personal Twitter account, there was a lot of work just for me, albeit a much smaller universe, but those were the questions that we were asked. Um, I know that uh, there were se several, as you can imagine, several constituents were not happy with certain people or, or policies or votes that they took. Um, I, I think Mr. Brooks's question is, is also really important on the retention. Um, I, I would just say, again, I fully support the use of, of social media and Twitter. Um, I would just, I would like to see these questions asked, answered, or, or set uh, before you actually establish an account. That was the recommendation. Um, would, would you guys like to uh, follow on the recommendation? Would you like to have a little bit more discussion or wait could for we, some of the could, follow Yeah, could we explore further into all the other parameters that the, the government does? Yeah. Because like, like you, have, you mentioned that there could be some derogatory comment, people might post on it. Uh, how do we deal with it at that time? Yeah. Well, that's part of the reason we did. We don't have a social media presence right now, and we are now one of the outliers that are not actively um, operating with a social media presence. And we were kind of encouraged by, I think, probably the department to get moving in this direction because we are now looking like an outlier as opposed to mainstream here. <laughs> But, but with that being said, I think if the board still has questions, I think three months, again, bring it back to the board, let the board be comfortable with it. Um, with, res with respect to the records retention, um, the records retention policy gets developed when you have a new system or something you have to do, and that's one of the components. We have a schedule that we have to identify all of our other records and how long we retain them, and in the event there's some special overriding concerns with social media, we deal with that there. I personally don't think we need to have it come back. I mean, I feel confident that our attorneys and staff will break those yeah. you know, policies and procedures. Is that okay, Ricardo? Yeah, not fine. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> okay, then we'll move on. Move on then. Uh, yeah. I think we need to vote. Do you want to vote? You need to vote with them first? If you're going to need to vote it down or up yet. All right, you need to go down the recommendation to send back to the committee, and, okay. Well, do we, wait a minute, do we need to do I don't think we need to send back to the committee. Do we need to have a motion? Yeah. 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 So what do you guys want to do? I think we should move forward. I don't think we need to send this back to the committee. As I said, I think I have you know, full confidence in our attorneys and our staff to create the rules around you know, the usage and the records retention. And then I guess if, if, staff, if staff has an issue, then you can send it back. Sure. Yeah. So go, go ahead and move forward. Let them explore yeah. the uh, other. Uh, can, I, can I say one more thing? I, I mean, I, I don't think it should, maybe I misstated this earlier. I don't think this should be contingent upon the results of, of what, I mean, I, I would like just like to see the board look at these issues as they're establishing this account. I'm fully, we're fully okay. In fact, we, like I said, we fully support having a Twitter account for the board. I think some of our members will appreciate being able to communicate uh, a little bit more directly with the board. Um, so if that's stopping you at this point, I, I'd say uh, we support it. Please move forward. Thank you. All right. Any other board members comment? Public comment? If, if not, let's uh, move on to, for, uh, to vote on the committee recommendations. The motion is to approve the committee recommendation. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion here. Okay, so <coughs> the uh, discussion of frequently asked questions related to inventory reconciliation reports of controlled substances, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 17, 15.65. Uh, the background is a major regulation uh, adopted by the Board of California Pharmacies and Clinics prevent drug losses and identify any losses early took effect April 1st, 2018. The new rule, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 17, 15.65, requires pharmacies to perform a periodic inventory reconciliation for all controlled substances 
The regulation also requires a physical hand count of all Schedule II drugs every three months. Many licensees have expressed questions about how to comply with the regulation. Commit, uh, some of the discussion <coughs> over the 11th uh, committee meeting, uh, staff reported on steps being taken to help licensees understand and comply with the new regulation. Staff, have, staff has compiled a post and, and posted a list of frequently asked questions uh, and answers on the board's website next to the regulation text. In addition, the uh, facts and questions were updated and published in the July 2018 issue of the script. A copy of the news articles in uh, attachment five in your folder. Uh, staff said a follow-up fa facts and question article is planned for the next script. In addition, staff provided, provided training on the new regulation at a board-sponsored CE forum on September 22nd in Winter Park. Uh, any questions? No, I'm very good. Yeah. What's that? We're in the park. Yeah, thank you for giving us the space. We didn't have. Discussion and consideration of granting CE credit for reading the script. The background, in November 2017, the board directed the committee to discuss and consider awarding CE credit for reading the script. At the January 2018 committee meeting, members suggested the pharmacist could earn one CE credit for reading each news letter, up to a maximum of two credits per renewal cycle every two years. In February 2018, the board directed the committee to pursue options for awarding CE for the script that would apply to the required two hours of board providing CE in law and ethics every renewal cycle. The board also asked staff to research ways to keep costs and required staff time for the CE to a minimum. Uh, some of the discussion we had in our October 11 uh, committee meeting. Uh, staff presented the following possible options for awarding CE uh, for the script. Uh, require pharmacists to self-certify reading the script. User, users could click on a link in the newsletter that would take them to a site to certify they have read the newsletter. This option would require no staff time to prepare and minimal staff time to process the CE. Estimated staff time to process the CE unit one minute. Um, number two would be require pharmacists to pass a quiz to be included with a script. Users would answer multiple <coughs> choice or true false questions based on articles. This option would require staff time to prepare questions and answers for articles. Estimated uh, staff time to process each CE unit per minute. Third option, require pharmacists to complete learning objectives after reading the script. Users would write a brief description of what they learned from reading the articles. This option would require more technical capabilities and staff time to review responses. Estimated staff time to process each CE unit, uh, five to 15 minutes. The committee discussed the amount of staff time required to carry out the program and the need to ensure CE provides uh, the professional competence of, of licensees. Staff said that the development, uh, developing quizzes for article, articles would not be a, uh, an obstacle. In public comment, speakers stressed the importance of having CE requirements that improve professional competence. It was suggested that the staff invite <coughs> pharmacy school faculty to write articles and quizzes for the newsletter. Uh, committee recommendations. I recommend that the board allow pharmacists who pass a quiz based on script articles to earn one hour of CE credit per newsletter, up to a maximum of two credits per renewal uh, period. As fulfillment of the two units of CE required to be earned for completion of a board provided CE to renew a pharmacist's license. Discussion, board, questions? Public? Okay, seeing no public comments, this is the uh, committee recommendations. So, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Opposed? Abstain? Okay, okay motion carried. Uh, 
uh, discussion and consideration of FDA guidance, indications, and uses section of labeling for human prescription and biological products, content and format. Uh, FDA regulations require a manufacturer's drug label to include an uh, indications and uses section. This section must state the drug is indicated for the treatment, prevention, mitigation, cure, or diagnosis of a disease or condition or for the relief of the disease or condition's symptoms. Uh, in July 2018, the FDA issued a draft guidance for industry, indications of use of sections of labeling for human prescription and biological products, content and format. The guidance describes the FDA's recommendations for how to clearly convey such information. A copy of the guidance uh, document is in your attachment six or the board's uh, Staff presented the guidance document for, for the committee's information on the October 11th meeting. There was no action uh, or public comment on that. Um, update and discussion of communication and public education activities by the board staff. We talked about that one. What's that? We already talked about that one. Oh, no, no. I, I, that was the discussion consideration of strategic goals for communication and public education. I mean, that's what I was getting. Um, anyways, we, we have uh, a slew of uh, articles here from the script, news media, public outreach, a lot of stuff that um, I know Virginia Herald, Virginia here has been real busy, uh, and you can see uh, she's been all over the place, doing a tremendous job, and uh, I just want to acknowledge her also. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And with that, um, there's uh, also some articles uh, that you, if you guys are interested in looking at, uh, they're, they're also uh, attached here. Uh, future meeting dates. The committee had announced its meeting dates for the next year, which are Tuesday, January 8, 2019, Wednesday, uh, April 10, 2019, Tuesday, June 25, 2019, and Wednesday, October 9, 2019. And that is the best of any. Any, any public comment? All right, uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, for your report on the public activity. And right now, I think we should adjourn for the day and we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you very much for attending. Go Dodgers. <laughs>